Lenten meditation, and we will be focusing on Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. The main thought of our Lenten theme this year is keep your eyes on the cross. Okay, so um, if anybody feels the need for a hymnal, I put the hymnals out here. Those hymnals have been used for several months, so they should be uh, free of germs or anything like that. So the hymnals are out there if you want to, if you'd rather sing the hymns according to the hymnal instead of the words on the screen. Okay, so, dear friends, let's begin. First hymn is number 114, Christ, the Light of All the Living. May God richly bless your worship of Jesus Christ, your dear Savior, tonight. Christ, the Light of All the Living, is the way we will begin. Let's begin with the invocation. 
congregation please rise. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Well, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. O Lord God, be with us during this hour of prayer. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Forgive us our sins, O Lord, and through your Son make us worthy to stand in your courts. Now we will sing Psalm 25. It's the old version in the Christian Worship Hymnal, page 74. <laughs> Oh. 
gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them are considered are given the title benefactor, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, This very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. And those are the words of our passion history for tonight. We continue our worship of our suffering Savior with the next hymn. It's number 100, A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining For. <laughs>
grace, mercy, and peace, these are the wonderful blessings that we have in our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's Word that we will focus our attention on tonight is recorded in John chapter 18, verse 11. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And those are the words of our text. In the name of Christ Jesus, dear fellow believers, uh, it is about 10 minutes to 7, 7 minutes to 7, something like that. And that means that it is officially nighttime. You're in good old Anago, Wisconsin. The sun is set for quite some time, and it's dark out there. It's not a very good time of day for seeing, but it's a pretty good time of the day for hearing. Now, sometimes members will come to me and they'll say, Pastor, when is the best time of the day for home devotions? And I say, well, you know, everybody has their own specific time for that, but I like the night time because by that time, all your chores are done, and, you know, you, you don't have so many things around to distract you, and whatever is on your to-do list by that time of the day, you may as well forget and you're just focused on hearing, hearing the Word of God. Tonight, we're here to listen to some very precious words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I quoted them before. He says to Peter, put your sword away. And I'd like for us to investigate those words, to learn as much as we can about them tonight. They're very deep. They're very full of a lot of good application for our life. So put your sword away, says Jesus to Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a, both a reprimand, of course, toward Peter, his disciple, and it is an acceptance, a humble acceptance that he offers to God that he is willing to carry out God's plan to save sinners. Okay, so first of all, put your sword away. We see that this is a reprimand. I think it's important for us just to remember the context here of this. I think most of you know that, but just a, just a little review I think would be in order. So Jesus Christ has done everything that he wanted to do in the upper room. So we just read about that. Um, you think of all the commands. We sometimes call that Commandment Thursday because on that Thursday in the upper room Jesus Christ gave his disciples so many commandments. He instituted the Lord's Supper. He told them to <clears throat> love one another as I have loved you. He he washed the disciples' feet. Then at the very end, we come to that portion of God's word that we discussed last Wednesday, where Jesus Christ offered what we call the high priestly prayer. And we looked at that one line in the high priestly prayer where, where Jesus Christ says, he says to heavenly, his heavenly Father, he says, glorify your Son so that I may glorify you. It was basically a prayer asking the Heavenly Father, for strength to face the ordeal that, that lay ahead. And then, as you know, then Jesus Christ went to the Garden of Gethsemane along with his disciples. And here is where Jesus really began to feel the weight of the sins of the world coming down upon him. You'll remember that Jesus Christ was, was we sometimes say, uh, he was in, the, in agony in the Garden because he was feeling the guilt of the sins of the world. And, and that was a very strange feeling for Jesus. Uh, he was not like us. We feel guilty practically every day for things that we do. But for the Holy Son of God, this was sheer torture for him to, to be feeling the guilt for all the sins of all the world, all the robberies, all the drug deals, all the rapes, all the unkind words that people say to each other, all the, all the wars that were fought aggressively and sinfully, Jesus is feeling the guilt for the sins of the world. And it's all kind of crushing down on his shoulders. The Bible says that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was just laying flat on his belly with his nose in the dirt, crying out to God for strength to face this ordeal that lay ahead. You'll remember that he prayed that if possible, that this cup, this cup of suffering might be taken away from him. And in his, in his anguish, he, he was sweating. He was sweating. The Bible says that the drops of sweat were like great drops of blood. If, now, we don't know exactly what that means, if the, the sweat was just kind of really thick and mucousy, 
or and it was like blood in that sense, or if it was actually a bloody sweat where the blood vessels in the person's face and neck, they burst uh, because of the stress. We were not sure of that, exactly how to interpret that, but suffice it to say that Jesus was in, in incredible agony. And he, he, he asked his disciples to, to help him. He said, watch and pray. You know, give me some moral support here. Watch and pray. And every single time, he, said, he asked that three times, every single time he comes back, and he finds his disciples disobeying him. They don't watch him pray. In fact, they fell asleep. When that happened the third time, then Jesus Christ said to his disciples, Rise and go. Here comes my betrayer. So Jesus Christ could see Judas coming, along with a great multitude of soldiers that were carrying lanterns and weapons and uh, staves, the Bible says, which were like sticks and those kinds of things. Jesus did not say to the disciples, hey, let's get out of here. The enemy's coming. I know of a back door to this Garden of Gethsemane. We can escape out there. He says, rise, go. Let us go to our betrayer. And when he goes to the place where the Garden of Gethsemane, where there's an entrance there, the Garden of Gethsemane, you have to understand, was a walled-in enclosure. It was actually an uh, olive-producing uh, area. And so it was all walled in. Olives were precious back then, so it was all walled in for security. So he goes to the entrance of that, and he goes to the soldiers, and he says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, well, I'm he. he he's he's going to give himself up. I am he. And the Bible says that when he said, I am he, that Jesus worked a miracle here, and the soldiers all fell backwards and down, just just like a bunch of dominoes. Boom, 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 boom. They all fell down. And then they, they got up again. Now, if I had been, or if you had been, in that group of soldiers, I think uh, by that time, you and I would be running, running away. We're saying, I'm not going to arrest this person who just made me and all the rest of the soldiers fall down. But uh, the devil had possessed them. The devil had come into them. The devil was controlling them. And they went ahead with their arrest. And when they began to arrest Jesus, to lay hands on him, then the disciples cried out, they said, Lord, shall we strike out with our swords? So I always admired this rather polite question of the disciples. They're asking permission. Lord, is this right? Should we be striking out with our swords? They, earlier in that evening, they said, Lord, we're gonna, we would die for you. So here they're really making good on that promise. They said, Lord, shall we strike out with our swords? Uh, we might die in the process, but do you want us to defend you like this? It was a very wonderful thing. It contained some holy restraint on their part, some good logical thinking on their part. But before Jesus could give an answer, <clears throat> impetuous Peter doesn't wait for an answer, and he draws the sword, he starts flailing away. And... I guess it's good that Peter was kind of lousy with the sword. He did not inflict any kind of a fatal injury to the soldier that he did. He just kind of swiped the side of his, his head there, and he cut off that soldier's ear. And immediately, Jesus Christ raised his voice, and he says, Put your sword away! He wants to stop that right away. Why the rebuke? Why, again, it seems almost like a noble thing on the part of Peter. He's willing to fight for Jesus. He's willing to, to, to wound and to be wounded for Jesus. It seems like a noble thing. But why that rebuke? Well, you just think it through. Um, the rebuke was very well deserved because Peter had put Jesus in a pretty difficult position. Now, people could go to Jesus and accuse Jesus of being anti-government. They could accuse him of being a rabble-rouser, accuse him of, of leading some kind of anti-government riot. And so that's why Jesus thought so quickly about this. That's why he rebuked Peter so thoroughly and said, put your sword away. He did not want anyone to accuse him of being someone who was against the government. On the contrary, Jesus would teach his disciples, and he still teaches us through his word, that we are to respect the government at all times. Some of you were in our Bible study on Sunday, Romans 13. 
the authorities that exist have been established by God, right? That's how, how it goes. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So we have absolutely no right ever to rebel against the government, the government that, that God has set up, unless the government commands us to do something that is sinful. But in this case, to, to, to arrest someone that was bring him in for questioning. There was, no, there was no sin really in that specific thing. And so Jesus Christ acquiesces to this. He's teaching his disciples to do the same thing. We should not rebel against the government. Do we need this command? I'm going to ask you that. Do we need this command? Put your sword away. Do we need this command really? Aren't there some times, for instance, when we should raise the sword? When we get in we uh, decide that the army is our career, and now we find that our country is in warfare, fighting a defensive war, never an aggressive war, that would be sinful. But to fight a defensive war or defend one of our allies, isn't it correct for us to raise the sword, not put our sword away? Well, absolutely. Um, of course, that isn't the situation here, but we have to remember that, right? Put your sword away, that doesn't really apply to us if we are in the military. And if we are helping either an ally or we are defending our own borders, our own country, then we should raise the sword. If we are fighting a spiritual battle, are we going to raise the sword? The sword of God's word? Absolutely. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, says the Apostle Paul. Now, of course, he's referring to the gospel in word and sacrament. The Bible says the gospel is the power of God. That wonderful message that we're f freely and fully forgiven by Jesus Christ the Savior. That's very powerful in pulling souls away from our enemy, Satan, and bringing them into the kingdom of God. We should, we should raise the sword in situations like that, but it's the sword of God's word and the sword of God's sacrament. But yet this reprimand is in order anytime we hate another person. So you know that sins are not only in deed and in word, but they are also sins, uh, we, it's also possible for us to sin in, in our thoughts and our thinking. And so if there's ever a situation where, even if we're, we're thinking about an enemy of Christ, we are to hate what they do and hate what they say, but we are not to hate them. For there we are called upon to love them and to evangelize them and to show compassion for them. You've heard of this passage before, right? Leave room for God's what? Leave room for God's wrath. That's, that's in the scriptures. So there God is teaching us. He's saying, look, uh, I reserve the right. You know, if, if I'm going to hate somebody, if I'm going to harden their heart and, and so that they can't believe and go to hell, well, then that's my prerogative. I will do that. I will do that kind of hating. You are not to do that kind of hating in any situation. You or I are not to do that. And uh, sometimes we do, right? I can think of a situation where there was a college professor that was making fun of Christians and my uh, daughter, Laura, she was attending uh, the University of Eau Claire. And she would talk to me over the phone and say, Dad, this professor, look what this professor did. You know, he said this, he said this. And it was all some really caustic, awful things against Bible-believing Christians. I have to confess, I had some pretty angry thoughts for that professor. Um, God knew those thoughts. Those thoughts were sinful. Those thoughts were sinful. So you got to remember that. Uh, this happened in, at Ascension here, well, probably 10 years ago already, where a, uh, one of our young men at the public high school, he was listening to some evolutionary teaching from his teacher. And so he wrote that teacher a very caustic letter. Very caustic. It was, it was filled with curse words. And how did he learn to be so hateful toward another person. Now he kind of, at first he justified, he said, hey, Pastor, he was, he was teaching evolution. He was, he was saying stuff that's against the Bible. You know? He deserved all that. No, no, he didn't deserve those words. 
how did he learn to speak like that toward, toward any human being? Well, he learned that from you. He learned that from me. He learned that from us, didn't he? When we display that kind of hatred toward people, it's only natural that the younger generation is going to pick up on that. So, uh, thanks be to God that he has a program for us. <laughs> it's, it's called Jesus Christ's Blood. And uh, his blood washes away all our sins, takes it all away. So let's repent of those sins. If we've committed those kinds of sins in thought, thought, word, and deed, let's repent of those sins. Being confident of Christ's forgiveness. And then move on, and at the appropriate time, put the sword away. Put the sword away in our thoughts. So these words were a reprimand. They were a reprimand toward Peter. They were a reprimand really to us as well. But they were also words of acceptance. Jesus Christ was accepting the plan of salvation that God had set up, the plan of, sal of saving your soul and my soul. The second part of our text tonight, Jesus says, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? So you have to understand how that word is used in the scriptures. The word cup, a lot of times, is used to symbolize God's wrath and God's anger. In fact, what would happen in a good share of the uh, sacrifices that the old Israelites would do is they would take a lamb, for, for instance, and they would take a cup of wine and they would pour the wine right on the back of that lamb. You know, just imagine that, that, that spotless, pure, white lamb. And then you take a cup of red wine and you pour that on the back of the lamb just before the lamb is slaughtered. So that cup symbolized the wrath of God coming down on that animal. But we all know that the real animal was Jesus Christ. As the hymn goes, not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain to give the guilty conscience peace or wash away its stain. So the real animal is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, by this time, he knows exactly what he has to do. He went into the Garden of Gethsemane saying, Father, if possible, can, can this cup be taken away from me? And then the Lord answered and said, no, it's not possible. You have to drink this cup. So by this time, Jesus Christ really has his eyes on the cross. And there isn't anything that's going to dissuade him from it. So when Peter raised the sword, Jesus said, put your sword away. I'm in favor of this. I want to go to the cross to take away the sins of the world. Dear friends, let's never forget that this shows tremendous, tremendous love for you and for me. You know, we kind of look at our world and we, we, we really kind of, we all kind of bemoan the fact that this world is filled with a lot of, a lot of lovelessness. Uh, there's lovelessness in families. There's lovelessness politically, where Democrats hate Republicans or Republicans hate Democrats. And there's lovelessness among all the different races, it appears. You know, you, get, you just get so tired and drawn out and depressed by all this lovelessness. But let's keep our eyes on Jesus. He goes to the cross. He goes to the cross willingly. He doesn't go for his own sake, but he goes for your sake. To take your sins away so that you can have so that you can have eternal life in heaven. He loves you. There is more love in the cross of Jesus Christ than we will ever even be able to comprehend in our entire lifetimes. And then as we think about that love, then what happens to our hate? It tends to just kind of melt away. And pretty soon we want to put the sword now, there, just before we conclude our lesson today, there's someone here I just want to talk about briefly, and that's Malchus. So, you know, Malchus was the servant who had his ear cut off. The miracle that Jesus performed is kind of unique. It was the last miracle that Jesus performed before he um, performed his great miracle of rising from the dead on Easter Sunday. So this is the final miracle. He takes that ear, that severed ear, it was probably lying on the ground or something, and he takes that and he, he just puts that back onto Malchus's head. He restores that ear completely, perfectly in not only its appearance, but its function. 
So it's really a, an incredible miracle. It enables Malchus to hear again. And isn't that so typical of Jesus? That Jesus would do that for someone. He's done that for us, you realize. That we were born uh, sinful. We were born spiritually dead. We were born people that had no interest in hearing about Jesus or the Bible at all. But he has opened our ears to the, to the words of Jesus. And we find them to be very instructive. And we respond to them. And we call them beautiful words. And that also includes these simple words that we looked at tonight. Put your sword away. Amen. Will the congregation rise for what we call the seasonal response? We'll read it together. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. O God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Receive with believing hearts the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace.
of course, concludes our worship, our, our Lenten meditation for tonight. So it's good to see all of you here tonight. Do be careful as you go home because all that water, you know, it uh, froze and there's some icy patches out there. So um, just a couple of announcements that uh, uh, our son, Dan Spouty, seminarian, he's going to be preaching here this Sunday. So um, I told him up front, I said, we're not going to pay anything. <laughs> um, but uh, usually what we do is we just have a like a door offering, but we can't do that because that's how we give all our offerings is through the door offering. So I'll put something on the table or some kind of a thing there, and if you want to give Dan a few bucks to send him on his way or to buy a book or something, that'd be good. Um, Sunday school also sings, right? Is that right? Uh, okay, so they're singing, and, and I think the way we're going to work that is it'll be the very end of the first service and beginning of the second service. So just a reminder then uh, toward that. Okay, so that's our announcements, and God be with you, and have a restful night in Jesus.